Coming up on Network Africa. Niger suspends military cooperation with the U.S. with immediate effect. The European Union and Egypt sign $8 billion deal to curb illegal migration. Plus... South Sudan shuts all schools as it prepares for extreme heat wave for two weeks. Hello and welcome to the program today. I'm Layo or Larry Day. Niger's junta has ended a military agreement that allowed U.S. personnel to be deployed in the country. The announcement came in the same week that a delegation from Washington had been in Niamey for talks with the country's military leadership. According to the ruling military spokesperson, Colonel Amadou Abradami, the suspension is with immediate effect. Speaking on local television, Colonel Abramane said the U.S. delegation did not follow diplomatic protocol and that Niger was not informed about the composition of the delegation, the date of its arrival or the agenda. The U.S. used its base in Niger to monitor regional jihadist activity. Now, this severance is seen as a blow to U.S. security interests in the region. The pact allowed U.S. military personnel and civilian defense staff to operate from Niger, which plays a central role in the U.S. military's operations in Africa's Sahel region and is also home to a major air base. Meanwhile, locals in Niamey have been reacting to the news that the country's military government had suspended cooperation with the U.S. One citizen says it is a salutary act that ne that's needed for decades. And according to political analyst Bounty Diallo, the Americans are not helping to fight terrorism in the country. It really is a salutary act. We've needed it for decades. How can a so-called sovereign country invade us with a simple verbal note? Such a powerful army, and they come to occupy our territory without any counterpart, without going through the National Assembly. And what's more, we also pay for their comings and goings. The government was talking about a verbal note. But a verbal note does not take the place of an agreement. Now, there's the fact that we're in a situation where insecurity is on the rise. But when you see the governments communicate, the Americans aren't necessarily there to help us fight terrorism. So you have to ask yourself why they're there at all. Well, let's discuss further on this. Joining us now is Defense and Security Analyst David Otto for more. Thank you so much for your time. Now, this suspension, uh, this ending of agreement between Niger and the U.S. follows an earlier move that had seen thousands of French soldiers exit the West African nation. My first question to you will be, did you see this coming? Well, I think that's the question which... Uh uh, the U.S. Congress and the State Department will be asking AFRICOM. Um, you know, this is a military base that was established uh, in 2014, and the expectation uh, was that um, it, you know, it will serve the Sahel. It will come as a shock, uh, and perhaps you know, this was not one of the calculations. But remember that the U.S. was being very cautious uh, when the military junta to power. They failed to call it a coup d'etat at the very early stage uh, because, you know, that would have, you know, deprived the U.S. from dealing um, with Niger. And of course, you know, that would then automatically prevent the U.S. from using its military base and carry out its um, intelligence and surveillance and reconnaissance mission, which is the main reason why that base is there. So um, I am sure that the big question would be, I mean, this would come from Congress, did the U.S. see this coming? You know, were there any signs uh, that the military junta will 
uh, pull in the, um, you know, uh, this um, Trump card in the sense of, you know, cutting ties with the U.S. But it's not shocking because, of course, Niger have already expelled the French. Uh, they had, you know, uh, indicated that they would leave ECOWAS immediately, although ECOWAS has asked them to return. Um, so um, this doesn't come as a shock at all. Uh, but let's see how it goes, you know, because, of course, there will be consequences from both sides, I believe. Now, let me ask you, hinging on your final thoughts there, uh, what do you think is at play here? I mean, Niger has been under military rule since July 2023, and the military rulers in, just like the military rulers in Mali and Burkina Faso, they've also kicked out the French and European forces, just like you've mentioned. But what are we seeing playing out here? These three countries have solidified their relations. Uh, you mentioned, you know, leaving ECOWAS, even though ECOWAS has asked them to return. Yes, I mean, of course, you know, Niger has a, don't know that, but they've also signed the alliance of uh, the Sahel state, you know, which is a defense pact. Um, they've indicated the creation of a confederation or a federation, whichever way they call it. They've gone far to establish a union uh, to fight against, um, you know, the jihadist groups within that region. So it's not, um, you know, something which, uh, you know, should be, um, you know, seen as a major uh, gap, you know, in the fight against jihadist uh, groups within the region. I think the big question that the military junta and Nigerians should be asking was how effective uh, was this U.S. Uh, intelligence, uh, surveillance and reconnaissance uh, in terms of providing uh, some security for, uh, for Nigerians. But I think, you know, again, the critical question for the U.S. would be haven't struggled uh, to find any country in that region, you know, to, um, you know, deploy a military base of that nation, or they call it uh, Air Base 201, where else will they go? The U.S. claims that this military base is used to fight against jihadist groups, about seven of them, uh, in, as far as Nigeria, Libya, uh, Chad, and of course, Niger as well. So the U.S. will struggle. Uh, but the question is, where would Niger go? For Niger, they've established an alliance. They've come up with uh, this idea that they've now established three countries that will be fighting against uh, jihadist groups. But, um, you know, it's still very early days. Maybe they're just looking for a way to bargain uh, with, the, with the U.S. authorities to give them less power uh, or less, um, you know, uh, standard rules, you know, in terms of how they operate this space. And, you know, they use the, the base there in Niger, that's in uh, Agadez, to monitor regional jihadist activity. What would be your assessment of this, how they fared so far in that region? And will their absence have any impact? Well, that base was established again in 2014. Um, it cost the U.S. about 110 million uh, U.S. dollars. Um, you know, I think the cost of actually maintaining that base a year is about the equivalent of 13 million dollars a year. Um, the question is, we still have an increase in the number of uh, jihadist operations within that region. Boko Haram ISIS is still acting very much in Nigeria. We do not know how much, um, you know, intelligence that the U.S. shares, uh, useful intelligence that the U.S. shares with uh, Nigeria. We don't know how much intelligence it does share with uh, Niger or Libya. Um, so. I think, you know, the, the, the most practical thing is to understand if this, you know, huge military base, you know, has benefited either Niger or all the intended countries that the U.S. carries out this mission. So um, I think that's what is going to be in the mind of the Nigerians. For the U.S., uh, the question is where next do they go? And, you know, if this military base was for uh, and solely for the interests of the United States, uh, then, of course, um, you know, the Nigerians will not want it to be on their soil. Um, so um, it's, uh, it's, it's a big issue, um, perhaps, you know, one that uh, will be negotiated. But I think the breaking point uh, from talking to people in Niger is the fact that the U.S., you know, was proposing uh, some kind of imposing, not proposing to the uh, Nigerian authorities that they may have to cut all ties with any other partner. Perhaps that would include countries like Russia. Uh, so I think this was a breaking point where the Nigerian thought, well, um, this is the last straw. We may as well kick out the U.S. because we've kicked out the French successfully and we will rely on our alliance, you know, in the Saharan states. So I think this is where the next trajectory is going, but, but too early uh, and maybe things could change, you know, um, in a short space of time. Well, we'll have to wait and see how it all pans out. But thank you so much. Uh
Security and, and Defense Analyst David Otto. Thank you. Just before we move on to other stories of the day, let's look, take a look at uh, stories and happenings that made headlines over the weekend. In Johannesburg, South Africa voters were seen flocking to a polling station on Sunday to cast their ballots on the last day of Russia's presidential election. Footage showed crowds arriving at the Russian embassy registering to vote and then casting their ballots. It was the same in Lagos, where Russian citizens living in Nigeria were seen casting their votes on the closing day of Moscow's presidential elections. Voters entering the Russian embassy heading into boots and casting their ballots spoke of the importance of the polls. Very important because we're voting for president and I want my voice to be counted. Even though I'm not in Russia, but I'm Russian citizen. It's my right to vote. The choice I make, I take, um, you know, uh, Whatever that comes out of it, I take it because it's my decision. So I feel it's important for me to vote because it gives me the privilege to exercise my right. Russia's presidential election took place over three days on March 15th to 17th. The election has given President Vladimir Putin his fifth term in office. We could see him in power till 2030. Early on Saturday morning, dozens of first responders and fire engines were seen on site of the Al Aram studio in Giza after Egypt's oldest film studio was engulfed in flames. Footage shows thick smoke rising to the sky as dozens of fire engines with high cranes surrounded the location. Firefighters can be seen putting out the fire on site while the crowd of locals gathered near the studio to watch the fire response efforts. The blaze reportedly broke out at 2 a.m. and was contained seven hours later after spreading to six adjacent buildings. Authorities say an investigation into the disaster is underway. Eritrean President Isaias Afweki and Somali President Hassan Sheikh Mohammed have held bilateral talks in Asmara, Eritrea's capital, uh, discussing the regional issues, including Somalia's fight against militants. This was President Mohammed's second visit to Eritrea this year and the sixth since he came to power in May 2022, and this uh, highlights the strong relations between the two countries. President Mohammed last visited Asmara in January uh, amid the tensions with neighboring Ethiopia that was over a port deal between Addis Ababa and the self-declared Republic of Somaliland. The deal is contested by the Somali government. Eritrea has been training thousands of Somali soldiers to boost the Somali army, even as African Union troops are expected to withdraw from the Horn of Africa country at the end of this year. Egypt and the European Union have signed an $8 billion agreement aimed at boosting cooperation in trade and security, as well as trying to stem the flow of migrants into Europe. The deal upgrades the EU's relationship with Egypt to a strategic partnership with grants, loans and other funds due to be delivered over the next three years to support Egypt's economy. The country's ongoing financial crisis has prompted an increase number of Egyptians to try to cross over to Europe, mainly through Libya, since the authorities have largely closed down the route from Egypt's north coast. President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi says Egypt is committed to curbing irregular migration to Europe by tackling the root causes through development-focused solutions and also improving regular migration routes. Welcome back to the program. Nigeria's legislators are looking forward to closer and more understandable partnerships with civil society organizations, and that's following a dialogue on understanding and sustaining collaboration with civil society. Now, this was put together by the EU Agents for Citizen Driven Transformation Program through the British Council and held in Lagos, Nigeria, over the weekend. The chairman, Senate Committee on Diaspora and NGOs, 
Senator Victor Ume said arrangements have already been concluded to reopen the civil society organization's liaison office and at the National Assembly complex to implement discussions. Our correspondent Amarachi Ubani reports. National Assembly members, led by the chairman, Senate's Committee on Diaspora and NGO, Senator Victor Omer, take time from their busy schedules to give priority to a workshop organized by the European Union through the British Council in Lagos. And what you, uh, what, was, what is it, five or six extra minutes? For two days, they robbed minds with representatives of civil society organizations on needs and wants with a common goal of creating a more conducive democratic society in Nigeria. So as regards the collaboration with the CSOs, we've done very well. Welcoming participants to the workshop, Country Director, British Council, Lucy Pearson, said as a council marks its 80th anniversary in Nigeria, it is proud to partner with the EU to help facilitate the workshop in helping to strengthen the partnership of legislators and CSOs. Also, so, National uh, Program Manager of EU ACT, uh, Mr. Uh, Damilari uh, Babalola, uh, emphasized uh, the need for CSOs to be more uh, credible. This two-day workshop provides a unique opportunity for us to explore ways to strengthen the partnership between legislators and civil society organizations, which will create an enabling environment where civil society thrives, legislative processes are enhanced, and the voices of all citizens are heard and valued. We think that if civil rights organizations are well capacitated, uh, they are doing very well in what they know, of, in what they know, you know, uh, 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 doing. Um, but there is weak regulatory environment, they won't be able to thrive in. Acknowledging the importance of civil societies in holding power accountable, the chairman, Senate's Committee on Diaspora and NGO, Senator Victor Omer, harps on the values CSOs bring to any government. The civil societies actually are the catalysts for driving the necessary changes in any society. When we have a vibrant um, civil society, the, the country will be on its toes. Uh, everybody will be on guard to ensure that the right things are done at the right time and at all times. He later revealed the Senate's plan to reopen a CSO liaison office in the National Assembly. We are reopening the civil society organization's liaison office in the National Assembly. That office will become a processing center for all the things that we need to be doing in Nigeria. At the end of the workshop, participants, both legislators and CSOs, look forward to better collaborations in the near future. Amarachi Ubani, Channel Television News. South Sudan's government has ordered an indefinite closure of all schools because of a heat wave that could see temperatures rise to as high as 45 degrees Celsius. The authorities warned that any school found open from Monday would have its registration withdrawn. Parents are being urged to stop their children from playing outdoors for prolonged periods as the heat wave could last for two weeks. Now, according to a statement released, there are already cases of deaths related to excessive heat being reported in the country. South Sudan is experiencing extended periods of high day and night time temperatures, and health authorities say this creates cumulative physiological stress on the human body. Last week, at least 15 children were reported to have died of meningitis and other heat-related illnesses. A team from South Sudan's People's Defense Force, SSPDF, Justice Directorate, has concluded a mission in Maridi to assess pending cases at the Army Division 6. Their work is to enable the prosecution of members of the armed forces who are suspected of having committed serious crimes, including sexual and other forms of gender-based violence. This initiative is supported by the United Nations Mission in South Sudan, and ONMIS says it aims to promote accountability among the armed forces. On Miss Justice Advisor Idrissa Sylvain said that the assessment will help to promote the rule of law and also contribute to the peace process in South Sudan. Uh, the assessment will help uh, to promote a rule of law, to bring justice to victims and hold accountable 
SS PDF members. The assessment will also contribute to the peace process in South Sudan. Indian naval forces, including special commandos, have seized the cargo vessel that had been hijacked by Somali pirates and rescued 15, uh, 17, rather, 17 crew members. Now, the Navy says that all 35 pirates on board the Maltese flagged bulk cargo vessel surrendered and the ship had been checked for the presence of illegal arms, ammunition and contraband. The vessel was hijacked late last year and the Navy said it first intercepted the vessel on Friday. The hijacking of the Rouen in December was the first successful takeover of a vessel involving Somali pirates since 2017 when a crackdown by international navies stopped a rash of seizures in the Gulf of Aden and the Indian Ocean. Congo has lifted a more than two-decade-old moratorium on the death penalty as authorities struggle to curb violence and militant attacks in the country. According to a Justice Ministry statement, the ban from 2003 allowed offenders accused of treason and espionage to get away without proper punishment. The statement adds that capital punishment will now be reserved for offenders involved in criminal conspiracies, armed gangs, insurrection, and also those who commit treason and war crimes. It will also be applied to the military, including those who rebel or desert and join enemy ranks. However, rights groups have condemned this decision, calling it a step back for the country. The shocking crime statistics in South Africa continue to present a concerning and grim picture of the current state of safety and security in the country. High rates of violent crime, including murder, robbery and sexual assault, continue to plague communities and negatively impact the lives of many individuals. President of the Zuliva Party, Bongani Baloyi, says that addressing these challenges require a comprehensive approach that involves effective law enforcement strategies when you reduce poverty you reduce crime directly so 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 people often people say the only way you deal with crime is to increase police service we disagree the, the, the police service must come at the stage where you've committed a crime yet we will still agree to the point that we need to improve public service improve the police but to deal directly with unemployment uh, to deal directly with poverty alleviation and reducing crime, we must invest in the economy. And what do we do with young people? That's the biggest question. What do we do with young people who are unemployed and unemployable? We must get them into a government program called conscription. So we must remove these 350s. You can't get 350 if you are sitting at home. You might, and the 350 will, part, will be part of a package that you go to conscription for two full years. And from there, we're also going to use the two full years to repurpose and redesign uh, tertiary education. So from our perspective, we're going to remove from universities a number of, of disciplines. Teaching, nurses, police, the military, and some infrastructure elements will be done uh, through government. And you're going to have specialized and specific areas of discipline in universities. That means you reabsorb people into the military and into public sector, you focus it better, and, and then you relieve the universities of uh, your, your first year applicants who would have gone and finally, on the program, the biggest annual street parade in South Africa has returned to the mother city over the weekend in Greenpoint, and that's the Cape Town Carnival. Performers take to the streets of Cape Town as the annual carnival kicked off, celebrating the city's vibrant cultural heritage and diversity. Excited fans and paratroopers wore extravagant costumes, some resembling jellyfish and even sweets, as well as unique floats, including the iconic seven-foot tall Zocala doll and a giant ant. The carnival decided to make us a school of fish that move in unison together, and we've, we've actually incorporated that theme into some of our dance moves as well. Yeah, because we can float and glide because we're on wheels. So we're perfect for the fish in the ocean. <laughs> Chairperson and co-founder of the Cape Town Carnival, Rachel Yachter, said they aim to capture something light-hearted, yet 
quintessentially South African. So this year what we understood was that people were in the mood for something light but something that's also very South African. In South Africa we have um, this past of uh, a divided society because of the legislation and policies we've had. In the Western Cape the population um, composition is according to the, the then classifications of white, um, Cape Malay, some Indian, some from other African countries. But our idea was that irrespective of where you come from, um, whether the diversity is in terms of age or socioeconomic status or race, um, that we'd be an open house for everybody. The theme of the event was lacquer an Afrikaans word meaning nice or enjoyable. 43 community groups and over 1,500 performers took part in the two-hour long parade, which stretched up to four kilometers along the fan walk in Green Point. And that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Olandi.